Okie doke. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. All right. We're eventually going to get to uh, Isaiah 51. And how long it'll take you to get there. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's calm down. Uh, <clears throat> so title, title of the day is a question mark. Uh, where do you live? And uh, <clears throat> so it's sort of like just to get us in the framework of thinking about where we spend our time. And I mean uh, that in terms of uh, sort of like our, our minds, you know, where, where we spend our time in our, in our thinking. Um, <clears throat> so we think of our residence uh, kind of like our homes in terms of place of refuge, safe place, place where the storms kind of remain <clears throat> outside, <clears throat> out there, you know, not, not in here, or at least not now, you know, while I'm at home, while we're at home. So I'm talking about like a physical residence, uh, <clears throat> but the mind, you know, functions a little bit differently uh, than that. <clears throat> so our physical bodies can be in one location. <clears throat> and I don't mean anything by this remark, but our, our minds can be in, in one location while our, uh, yeah, our bodies can be in another, something like that. But, uh, you know, so uh, for many people, the mind lives in places that are <clears throat> not, uh, so safe a refuge, places uh, where the storms still um, rage in here uh, <clears throat> and uh, whether real or imagined out there, so to speak. So the invitation today uh, is for us to uh, live in a little place we might call gratitude. You know, I think, um, think about that. Think about it like a, a metaphor, you know, if there was such a community and I want us just to propose this as a thought experiment. Uh, you know, imagine there was a <clears throat> little town <clears throat> and it was called Gratitude and three people lived there. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, and they were called past, present, and future. <clears throat> three people, three residents, past, pre present, and future. And, and they all kind of coexisted together uh, because they <clears throat> all possess the same kind of basic mindset, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and that working mindset uh, was fundamentally uh, one of gratitude, and that allowed them to all, you know, kind of get along together. <clears throat> so, I had a working premise for this this study, and I'm going to get that out of uh, Isaiah 51. Not the entire thing, but a few places out of Isaiah 51. But we won't get there for a while. <laughs> we take a little bit to get our engine started today. And so the, the premise is kind of set off like this, that grace keeps us grounded in gratitude, and then gr gratitude further grounds us in the goodness of God. And so I'm sort of linking uh, grace with gratitude, gratitude with goodness, and goodness with, you know, uh, God's essential character, something like that. You know, it all mixes in there to, together. And, of course, we know that goodness is one of those two descriptors of, of uh, the essential character of God or who God essentially is, you know, from the, the 100th Psalm of the 5th <clears throat> verse. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we get the sense of, um, for the Lord is, is good. You know, we get that, you know, predicated of God. The Lord is good. In the first John 4, 8, God is love. You know, those are just two places where it's flat out stated. But in Isaiah uh, chapter 51, I mean, this week, uh, plowing through, I have, <clears throat> I have this, <clears throat> all my st st students know this discipline. It, uh, so I'm up at three every day, but um, uh, from six, six to six ten, I do this little, I have this little exercise. Um, so Sally got me this, this pad of, I mean, you can get up, see them at Walmart, but it's this big, thick pad of uh, lined paper, and at the bottom, it just says faith, I think, on the outside of it, something like that. That's a good title for a pad of paper, but lined, lined, uh, lined tablet. But at the bottom, there's a verse. So you can't pick and choose the verse, you know, but there it is. And now I'll write a, a, like a devotional kind of thing. You know, I'll just write that six, six to six ten. So you got to be fairly extemporaneous about this thing. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so, so this uh, one particular verse, uh, I can't even remember which one it was because I, I just jumped into the whole Isaiah 51, but it was, boom, one of those in Isaiah 51 just leapt off the page and they got me out thinking about <clears throat> uh, God's grace in there. It was so rich. 
uh, and, and his gratitude. And, uh, and so um, then that, you know, just sort of launched into what amounted to be, um, you know, kind of an interesting study that kind of picked at my brain through the week. But <clears throat> really the grace of God permeates this in, entire text. And if, if you just take a look at the opening portion of Isaiah 51, you see in, in verse 2, where he, where he says, and he's, he's calling to it, I mentioned the context of this uh, in, in, a, in a little bit, which you probably already know, uh, the context in general of, of this passage. But um, look, at, look at what he says, and this is interesting, but he says, uh, you know, look to Abraham, your father, uh, speaking of the Israelites, and to Sarah, you know, he gave birth to you in pain uh, when he was but... But one, you know, I called him and then I blessed him and multiplied him. And we see the grace of God there. But And the reference to the call of Abraham in the Lord's word, but uh, for, for, he, for he was but one. And then this kind of purposeful rejoinder, if I can use that word, as though God is making an argument to his people. He's trying to convince them of something here, right? Um, that I might bless him and multiply him. You just see this idea about grace, you know, grace, 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 grace. I, God, taking it upon himself, I'm going to multiply you and that kind of thing. And you can then, you know, f fill out some of the details a little bit here, right? Because grace brings to the impoverished. You know, I would just say, well, here's just a flat out principle, right? Grace is grace then brings to the impoverished and to the impotent because <laughs> who else would, would, would grace be of any use to whatsoever, Right. Uh, to the impoverished, to the impotent, all that is required to deliver on the promises made. I mean, that's the whole notion of, of grace. And here in the case of Ab Abraham, if you were to review, go back to Genesis and review passages like Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Genesis 15, 1 through 21, 17, 1 through 8, 21, 1 through 7, to 22, 1 through 19, all those critical steps. Yeah, you could take a little hiatus into Genesis 16 as well, the whole case with Ishmael and Hagar and the little sidestep. That's kind of interesting too to, to include in there. But all those with regard to the, the covenant and the reiterations of the covenant, the renewal, and so on and so forth, um, all those just, just have the backdrop here to this little simple uh, reminder here. Look to Abraham, you know, look, look to him. And what? What are we supposed to see about that? Um, you know, and, and, um, you know, previous to that, he's going to say, he, he's the rock, you know, he's, he's the, the quarry out of which you have been hewn, in, in other words. I mean, this is just really interesting imagery, you know, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but <clears throat> the whole reference here is, is just about grace. I did that with him, you know, you, you can count on it. Uh, look, look at what I'm going to do with you. But the whole point being this of grace, gratitude, goodness, God. Just happens to break down that way in English, right? All G's. But, but uh, uh, so, so again, just begging that, that question, you know, where, where do we live? Uh, again, you know, where, so where do we spend all our time? And it's, this is, I think, reasonable to think that way because we're reasonable people, rational people. We spend a lot of time inside our head. I mean, we really do. Uh, so, so we're there, our thought life and anything else. So <clears throat> we can intonate things like, um, you know, phrases, you know, I don't deserve this and say either like, oh, we get a gift. I don't deserve this. Or we, or, or something happens. I don't deserve this. You know, however we say that, but we could, we could intonate that. I don't deserve this. Put an exclamation point on it and really intonate that the wrong way, especially toward God um, and to our spiritual peril. When in fact, grace, grace then instructs us to, to look carefully at our lives to observe all that we have by virtue of God's daily gifts. On one point, and we've done this several times, we look at James chapter 117, these gifts that are God's good and perfect, things are just raining down that can't be eclipsed, right? And we, we learn that from, from James time and time again. Um, but, but, and say, well, I don't deserve, I don't deserve this, all right? That's what grace does. Grace kind of inverts that, um, lack of spiritual aptitude at times and say, well, I, I don't deserve all these benefits, but I, but I have them. And I have them by virtue of, of a God who loves me and is good in his, in his daily care of me. Um, and here's, this, here's this, uh, this, this spirit of gratitude because God is fundamentally good. And, and we just realize that this, that uh, we, we ground uh, um, 
uh, our gratitude in the goodness of God, in a God who cannot be other than good, who's predisposed in his goodness towards his creatures and, and towards us. And we're just utterly convinced of that. You know, we just, we just have to be. This is, again, uh, the essence of uh, the 100th Psalm and the 5th verse. <clears throat> Matter of fact, when you come across verses like that, you know, for the, for the Lord is good. You know, his mercies are everlasting and his truth endures to all generations, right? This is the, the end of that psalm, right? You get, you get to that. And somewhere along the line, and you, you undoubtedly don't uh, articulate things the way I do, and that's probably to your, your advantage, but, <laughs> but I, I would just say that um, if I could give you one little insight, it would be this that when you come across certain things like that in the Bible, you either say to yourself, say, your, say self, that statement is either objectively true or it's objectively false on its face. And we align our lives and our thinking with that, right? And so, I mean, I mean really, because in the face of circumstances are gonna militate <laughs> otherwise, right? Because this is what Satan does. You know, this is, he, he wants to convince us that that statement on its face is, is not objectively true, right? He's, he's going to want to bring circumstances in that are going to say, what? How can this be happening to me at the same time that that verse claims that God is good, his mercies are everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations when this world is just totally out of control? And, and by the way, that's fine if all that's happening over in the Middle East, or that's fine if that's happening in Africa, or that's fine if that's happening in Chicago or some crazy place out there. But when it touches me and my life, when it's my health, when it's my circumstances, when it's my job, when it's whatever, um, then all of a sudden it's a game changer, right? Then, then how can I reconcile those two things, right? So. If, if I propose that if I were called by God to suffer every day, it would be a blessing if in doing so, serve the good end of his intended purpose to work all things together for good. That would be understanding Romans 8.28 as being objectively true and not that I was the center of the universe and so on and so forth, right? So that's in essence, um, you know, what we do. Understanding my life is just a, a mist in, in comparison to the, to the sum total of all things. And somehow God is, is in need of, of me, has placed me here purposefully um, to serve his, his good end. And, and, and he doesn't have to tell me what that is. And I, he's not obligated to tell me what that is. I don't know what that is. Um, just another passage came to mind. Acts 20. And I'm just thinking, hey, hey, if Paul could tell us a little bit about how he thinks. And so I certainly am not qualified to speak for Paul or to think for Paul. Uh, nor, nor is anyone in the room either, but we can, we can only like take a shot at it, right? And say, hey, Paul, could, could uh, us in this room, you know, maybe try to figure out what you're thinking? <laughs> you know, we'll try. Uh, Acts 20, I not thought of this and see what you guys think, but ladies and gentlemen, you know, Acts 20 and, and 19, uh, you know the passage, but you know, he's, he's going to, he's going to bid a farewell to the Ephesian elders, and here in 2019, I, I see this participle here, but uh, in verse 17, it says, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and then called him the elders of the church, right? And, and when, they, when they had come to him, he said to them, well, you yourselves know from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, and then and watch that, verse 19, serving the Lord. I mean, he said, you know, so, so this is what I'm doing. Uh, I'm serving the the Lord. Uh, I don't know if it's Dulu, I mean, something like that. It might be. Uh, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and trials 
which came upon me. You see that context there, right? So he, he's like, I'm really taking it. <laughs> I'm getting slammed. Um, I want to say I'm getting killed out here, but that's not, that's not short of Paul, right? Because he's really, I, I, you know, th there's a lot about Paul that could make that argument. Yeah, I'm out here just suffering every day. You know? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's really, it, 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 if I'm not in prison, somebody is trying to track me down to throw me in prison. You know, I, the, it's almost a little bit like Elijah. Remember Elijah? Somebody's either hunting him down <laughs> or trying to track him down. You know? Somebody's on his heels. But yet he says, what? I'm just serving. I'm serving the Lord. I mean, it's a, it's a participle, meaning that's my mindset. I'm just going to keep serving you, Lord. I'm going to keep serving you, Lord, serving you, Lord, serving you, Lord. Then I thought of another passage. Let's try this one out and see, see if it fits where we're going here. Uh, Hebrews 12, because it's a passage very familiar to us, right? He Hebrews 12, 3 and 4, are right on the... The, the cusp there of, you know, connecting 11 and 12. So you have all the by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, elongating out that discussion. And then you turn the corner, therefore, you know, hey, come on, let's go, let's keep going. You've got that crowd in the crowd, cro sorry, crowd in the cloud. There's grace for the race. There's fun in the run, but you got to look to the book. That's four points right there, by the way. <laughs> Um, uh, but uh, you got to fix your eyes on Jesus, right? But then, but then what? Three and four. Consider him. Now, who what? Now here's the suffering, right? So, so, so my intended purpose here. I'm here in this world to what? To suffer. So again, going back to that. Uh, what, what if I'm here to suffer? What if my intended purpose here is to suffer uh, if, it, if it serves the purpose of your greater good, God? I mean, what if that's it? And then I look at Jesus and I say, so, so God put him here, put his son here uh, to suffer. And you look at the first, he says, consider him. Well, that's got to mean something. Consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So uh, this part of that whole discussion, but then that's not everything, right? Not everything for us is just cradle to grave. That's not the whole story, right? That's just the, the mist. That's not the whole story. I mean, that's... <laughs> Gratitude is grounded in the goodness of God, but that's not the whole story, right? There is more, <laughs> you know, like Paul, if, if you're, you're starting on it to get more of Paul, you start in Philippians, right? He says, I, I don't know if I'm going to stay here. I must stay here and keep, keep getting slammed and keep serving. Okay. That's furthering your purposes, Lord. But then, wow, to go and to be with Christ is what? Far better. Remember he says far better, but I'll be willing to, you know, remember he says, I'm torn between, I don't know. So there's more, but it's, it is gratitude, I thought, that, that resets the altitude of our attitude. You know, I think my attitude a lot of times needs that, needs a bit of resetting, because you do, you get, you get what? You get, you get pulled down, pulled down on this worldly plane a lot of times, and, and it's gratitude that gets us up there. So a few questions will We'll get our minds tracking with the with the topic, maybe. But do do you spend much of your time thinking about or dwelling on the past? You think about that for a second, but not too long. Do you often find yourself preoccupied or fixated upon, or even fearful of the future? Uh, or perhaps you live simply for today, giving <laughs> no thought regarding tomorrow, and leave the past behind. Is that you? Yeah. So you've got a few options there. Uh, so with this somewhat uh, settled, if you're able to think that quickly, um, we'll make some observations. So to mention the past, the present, and the future is to recognize um, three areas of primary occupation for the mind. Uh, so when any one of them becomes the area of primary focus, it then determines the altitude of our attitude when our spiritual well-being is concerned. 
For example, <clears throat> we look at passage we all know, 633 of Matthew. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things uh, shall be added unto you. Uh, but where kingdom of God and his righteousness, this is to be our chief and present. So when do we do this? In the present. In the present, this is be our chief and present occupation. So Jesus called his disciples to this daily discipline, the discipline of living in the present by marching to the beat of the rule of Christ, aligning with the values and authority of his kingdom, and doing so in the face of being tempted, if you remember the context, tempted to be anxious concerning the ability to provide for one's basic needs. Remember the whole context it was about what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall put on. Or in other words, what's going to come of me? Anybody ever worry about that? Or some future scenario. Let, let the problems of today be enough for today. You know, future scenario, this worrisome trap. Then we could look at uh, Philippians uh, 3, 13, and 14, where Paul says, Paul, Paul says, as brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. That is, you know, ultimate, this Christ-likeness, right? But one thing I do, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press towards the, the mark you know, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul reveals insights concerning his own experience, and he takes a collective look at his own progress in sanctification and growth in likeness to Christ. That is, his past efforts to get to this point in the present then redoubles his present efforts to be singularly focused on one thing to forget past achievement and thus to strain his neck toward the finish line of the upward call of God. In other words, his tomorrows are pulling his todays upward to advance one goal to obtain one prize, Christ likeness. So we've kind of established the obvious perhaps that past, the present, and the future are impactful on us spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. So how, how should we relate to each in terms of our thought life and the dangers posed as prospective residences for our mind? You know, where do we live? This isn't aimed to be psychological, really or some type of psychological investigation, but more of a pedestrian kind of approach to, to consider the main idea. So what of the past as a, as a possible choice of residence, the past? Well, the past is a shadowy place. It functions like a large movie screen, if you can imagine that, with maybe some type of a theater, cushioned seats, and someone there beckoning you to come in, sit down, and enjoy some comfortable setting, maybe there's some surround sound, and listen to some looping presentation of all of your failures. So is it wrong to recall the past or maybe visit the past? Well, well, that depends. You know, to recall and, and visit is to do so with the mind because after all, the past does not exist except in our memory. So we must uh, dwell on the past or ruminate on the past, something like that? No. No, we shouldn't do that. Um, but what are some helpful steps in the event that our habit is to become, you know, trapped there, tempted to, to go in, sit down, and just view, listen to um, all of these things, get fixated on the images of failure until heaps of regret and recrimination overwhelm our conscious thoughts in the present. You know, a lot of people live this way, you know. They're perfectly functional in the present, but their minds are in the past. Living, this constant looping business, right? So I would say one, uh, be sure that the facts being presented to you are correct and not embellished. Who knows? 
And then what are the lessons the facts offer? Have you accepted the lesson or are you adjudicating the case over and over and over again? Have you applied the lesson and have you learned the lesson? So here's the analogy or an analogy, if you will. Don't drop your anchor in the past. Rather, pick up your anchor, pull the lesson or lessons that you've learned into your boat, raise your sail, set your course, and move on. The lesson is all you need to take with you from the past because it is all that remains that is real in the present moment. And I can't underscore the word real enough. It's all that will keep you from replicating failure or reproducing poor judgment into the present. Uh, one of the future as a possible choice of residence? Well, the question is moot because like the past, the future doesn't exist. That is to us anyway. I'm not saying in terms of God and his knowledge, but to us in terms of our ability to know the outcomes. Nevertheless, we are positively to plan for the future in light of kingdom values and our eternal home. That's what Jesus commanded. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Paul observed Philippians 1, 21, for me to live is Christ and to die, that would be future <laughs> to his presence. He's not dead yet to say it. And to die is gain and then dutifully lived, as he said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, in view of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus to attain Christ's likeness, right? This is, this is Paul. But then negatively, negatively, we are not to fear the future because God has every aspect, every detail under his sovereign control. Of just one passage uh, in Revelation chapter 5, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1, verses uh, about midway through verse 5 and then down through verse, verse 8. And uh, actually, verse 8 is sufficient. You know, I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, who is and was and who is to come, the Pantocrator. The minute you say that in Greek, I just like it better than Almighty. Uh, Pantocrator. <laughs> Pan, ta, krator. <laughs> you know, the, all, the Almighty. I mean, literally, that's what it literally means. The one who hands, has his hands on everything. Um, the one um, whose power controls uh, absolutely everything. So um, then we are negatively not to presume on the future because our lives are subject to the finite bounds of the present moment. Hope that makes sense. Um, if you are bound, <laughs> not only spatially in your body to one place at one time, uh, if you are bound um, to live your life and subject to the finite bounds of, of anything that you can do, uh, simply within your control, which is you are subject to uh, the limitations of your next breath and your next heartbeat. <laughs> How in the world can you presume <laughs> on any more than that? And is this not, and I include myself in that, I'm not implying it's just you, uh, but James chapter 4, is that not the argument here? James chapter 4, uh, and beginning at, at verse 13, Come now. You who say, whoever you are, today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make profit. That's just pure presumption, you know, on, on tomorrow. You do not know what your life, you know, you're, you're a vapor, right? So the place to live then is in the present. The idea is to keep both your mental feet firmly planted in the present while learning from the past, that is applying its lessons, planning for the future, not living in the past or living in the future, which is mentally impossible because these physical states do not exist, that is to us, and to do so mentally through the imagination is to do what? It's to burden yourself down with guilt over past failures or anxiety or over events that you cannot control 
and may never occur. So in essence, to do so, that is mentally live in the past or future or both, while consciously living in the present is to import the problems of either or both as burdens and anxieties into your daily life. And if you look at, uh, for example, uh, isn't this what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34, where he says, so, <laughs> after he comes to this whole, whole thing, right, which is beautiful, everything he says, and then as if we miss everything, so, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble for its own. And then, since we've, you know, sort of taken an analytical look at all of that, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 5 now, at a passage that we know only too well, and you look at 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, Paul similarly saying, a so or a therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. How? Casting all of your care upon him, all your anxiety, in other words, but all your care, for he cares for you. Casting all your cares, that's what you're doing, because he is caring for you. Now, I look at that and I say, hmm, if I reverse that and say, because he's caring for you, why would I care for myself? You know, like, for example, um, that's really encouraging if I read that backwards, <laughs> you know, which is the way I should read it, because if it says, wait a minute, this is telling me that God never stops caring, ever. Uh, we have this way of saying, like, I care. Hey, do you care anyway? Do you care? You know, stuff like that. But I, th I think what we mean by that is, like, a f more of a feeling, right? Or a feeling. But this is more like attentive care like attentive, like you would for Nolan, right? You, that's more attentive. Like you, you're, you're right there. You're going to help him put his coat on, or maybe not, you know. Hopefully he can do that, right? But it's more attentive care. It's more, you know, attentive. This is God. This is God is, is attentive care, that type of thing. So what's my stress? What's my worry? This says God is not standing off someplace thinking like, yeah, I don't know, uh, just call me in. Call, call me in whenever you, you, you run into a snag, you know. That's not what the verse says. But this is like, this is like saying, hey, Doug, you know, uh, you know, humble yourself, humble yourself and, you know, and give it up already because here's somebody who is, who is caring for you, um, you know. Psalm 55, 22 is, is saying the same thing, basically the same thing. So re to return to the analogy uh, of the anchor in the boat, which I kind of like that, uh, it's like punching a hole in the hull and bailing water to stay afloat. You know, it, this, is, this is what it's like to attempt to mentally live in the past and in the future while trying to be functional in the present, it's like punching a hole in the bottom of the boat and you are like trying to row this, <laughs> this boat while bailing water out of it. This is what you're doing because you are intentionally taking on water and bailing it out and taking on water <laughs> and bailing it out. You're expending all of this energy and this Counter, being counterproductive, yet many believers live their lives this way um, every, every day. And, and this isn't a criticism, it's an observation, and it's well warranted because the Bible spends so much time you know, on it, because God knows who we are, right? So if we find ourselves facing the past, the present, and the future in the sense that we cannot live in these states simultaneously, but become trapped in them mentally through guilt or anxiety, then, then what are we supposed to do? And um, 
The Bible way, which is to say God's way, is not to it is is to um, adopt a spirit of gratitude that reconciles the past and the future into today, the present. So we, we reconcile. How, how do you reconcile? How do you pull them all together? You know, in other words, those, those three living in the same community with the same mindset. Um, you reconcile them. And I'm just going to suggest, this is, this is what I think is so neat about Isaiah 51. Um, it, it's just one place. So I think it's probably a biblical principle. That's why. Um, that it's that spirit of gratitude that really enables us to reconcile. If I adopt that spirit of gratitude, it's like a Venn diagram. If you take the passport, then it just works that way. You find gratitude is like the glue right in the middle. So this means that my present is one that is consumed with gratitude to God for the lessons he's taught me from the experiences of the past. And the day uh, that is before me is the life that I'm now living by his grace and the plans that I'm making are surrendered to him, the one who is ordering all my tomorrows. It's something like that. So now for some Bible context from Isaiah 51, a few passages from there to establish the point. So Isaiah's prophecy in chapters 40 through 66, that's Isaiah part two, right? Um, is depicting the nation of Israel in a state of misery due to sins that had you know, despised prophetic warnings, forced them into exile. This much we know. So the prophecy is an appeal of comfort from God to his people. And you see that in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 1, right? Comfort, comfort you, my people. And that a whole extended section about, well, she's paid double for her sins and, and all of this, right? So God will deliver them. If you look at Isaiah 50, 51, 1 and 2, um, God will deliver them as impossible as it might seem to their eyes. So, you know, in other words, what they were seeing, uh, as, as impossible as all this might seem to their eyes, um, in the moment of their present captivity, but they must look to what? Look to their rock, this is Abraham, from which they were hewn. This, is, this would be evidence of a miracle of how God would establish them, um, you know, kind of how God had established them in the first place and, and how he, he will uh, restore them now, right? It's just, you know, this whole idea that you know, you, you were just, he, he was just one. Now he became many. Uh, certainly, um, I, I did that. I can, I can do this kind of understanding. So they are to recognize that though they had sinned, God is willing to look upon them with favor, to comfort them, to deliver them, to release them from their oppressor, which is what the entire um, chapter is dealing with. So their present Wilderness experience is to be transformed. Verse 3 is absolutely remarkable. That this present wilderness experience that they're in is to be transformed into an Edenic experience of joy and gladness by a spirit of gratitude. What in the world can that possibly mean? But if you read this, look at this. In other words, if you, if you just take a cursory reading of this whole thing, and not even, not even reading it, just let your lights, your, your eyes bounce. You're going to see things like listen, look, um, pay attention, lift up your eyes, listen, awake, awake. You see all those things like that, right? Rouse yourself. You see all that stuff? So it's, it's all these like calls. And when is that? In the future? In the past? It's like right now, right now. He's like trying to get their attention and they're there depicted anyway as being under this Babylonian captivity and, you know, just kind of in misery, um, suffering for their sins and all these types of things. But then verse three, this is an amazing, amazing verse. And it's an amazing demonstration of the grace of God because, I mean, think about this. We sit as readers knowing the whole history, we know how the whole thing turns out. They are, are in real time, much like our discussion about which Moses are we talking about, the guy sitting out in the wilderness or the guy sitting at the burning bush who doesn't even know the first plague yet. He doesn't know how the story's gonna turn out, right? But here, they don't know. 
except they're sitting in Babylon. They're hearing all that Chaldean language going on around them. They're, you know, their, their former life is gone and probably gone forever. They're never going to see their homeland again. You know, all this kind of thing. And look at verse 3, and now they're hearing from the prophet, Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He'll comfort all her waste places. And indeed, wilderness, her wilderness, he will make like Eden. And her desert, like the garden of the Lord, joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and the sound of melody. What he's, what he's doing is he's calling upon them now to take up this spirit of of, in other words, all the all this stuff that he's reporting to them is intended to transform their misery into a state of comfort and joy and gratitude. Not because of their circumstances, the prevailing circumstances. Their circumstances are not going to change. Not, not, not a bit. But they're, listen to me. <laughs> Listen to me. Awake, awake. You know, it's the call. It's a call to consider the one who is to save them. You know, the one who is to deliver them. And this idea that grace keeps us grounded in gratitude and grat gratitude further grounds us in the goodness of God. It's a, it's a, then look again away from our circumstances and where we are to the God who is our redeemer and the one who, who loves us. And, uh, you know, that's what you get. That's what, again, that passage, if, you've, if you haven't seen that, but in Revelation chapter one, the one who's coming for you, look at this. Um, the one who's coming for you, I am Alpha and Omega, this kind of thing. But if you notice in Revelation 1, 5, um, yeah, it's... it's um, uh, to him who loves us. You never want to miss that. One of the trans, I, what is your, it was a King James. Is it loved? Yeah, a little brutal there, but it's, it's present tense. So it's loves. Um, it is present. So you want to keep that in mind, right? So this is a, it is a present, 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 um, unceasing. And 29.11 of Jeremiah, um, For I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a, a future and a hope. So when we learn the lessons from the past, we cease to struggle with God. We pull up anchor. We move on by his steadfast grace with gratitude for the day before us. A day he is walking with us, a day he has planned for us. This is the trap of the past is somehow we want to uh, adjudicate, pull into the courtroom, all that stuff as if to say, God, come on, right? No. Um, pull up that anchor, uh, move on, move on. 29-year-old um, Jim Elliott, you know, the four, Alka Beach, um, this was to be a high, highly anticipated day. They expected to uh, uh, contact the Wa'orani tribe, evangelize them. They didn't expect to be in eternity that day. They were martyred that January day, 1956. Um, so here's, here's Beth, uh, his wife and daughter. Um, you know, they're gonna go back and live with the Alka, she takes, if you're in Isaiah 51, if you go just back up a few verses, it's right in the same column, right in the same column on this page, 50 and seven, she takes this verse, for the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced, therefore I have set my face like flint. That was her, that was her little passage right there, therefore I set my face like flint. And I know I will not be ashamed. And, and of the verse, she noted two insights. She said, help from others is transient faith. Help from God is transformative reliance. And the testimony seems, seems relevant here only to point out that I, I, I would think, I would think that only somebody who is fundamentally grateful, fundamentally grateful, um, 
could make such a sacrifice as she did. And then I think of Jim's testimony in, in death. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. Um, but he was armed. I mean, he had a handgun on him. He was armed. And, uh, but they had decided that they were not going to take the life of, uh, of a tribesman, even if theirs was threatened. They weren't going to do it. So he could have spared his own life. But um, the sacrifice, the sacrifice of both of them, um, I think only, only those who understood what gratitude really is, is being grounded in the goodness of God and what really the goodness of God is, has nothing to do with good things that are done. It is ultimately what goodness is as a virtue that is embedded in the essence of God's character. Uh, it's truly r remarkable. I don't think it's something that we easily, you know, um, process, you know, and understand in terms of some of the remarkable sacrifices of some people. But given that, given that uh, statement, uh, Philippians chapter four, then maybe um, uh, the context is enriched a little bit here. Maybe Philippians chapter four and and uh, verse ten, where he says, Paul says, uh, "But I rejoiced." In the Lord greatly that now at last you have um, re revived your concern for me um, before you lack the opportunity. Now I, I speak for, from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am, for I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Both states, he's completely indifferent to. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction, so, so on, so on. And we can see why rejoice, why joy, and think of this, this is Philippians. Why joy, rejoicing, and thanksgiving are so prevalent in a letter he wrote from prison. And look at Isaiah uh, 51.5. Isaiah 51.5, where he says, My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples, the coastlands will wait for me, and, and so on. And I think just something to, to, to say here, that sometimes people have a problem with injustice and this idea of, you know, um, what, what, what about um, all these injustices that, that, have, that have been done to me and struggling through this, and yet the whole context of Isaiah 40 through 66 has to do with the, the suffering servant. And it's what's, what's amazing here, all these sections, Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and 52 are all these little sections about the, the suffering servant that ultimately is going to have its fulfillment in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. And, and here in 51.5, God's promising to render justice on his peop, uh, to his people on behalf of the injustices they, they've suffered, as well as all the untold violence and ungodliness so prevalent among the nations. And um, so here the cross is sufficient evidence that justice has already been rendered. And humanity sits on death row having been sentenced. The stay of execution order is available to those who will accept it by faith. But the clock is ticking. You know, it's ticking on, on two levels. One is for individuals because we have a finite amount of time in this world, and then there's God's eschatological timetable. But as a measure of, of, present, of present comfort, um, he's telling through his prophet to those people uh, who are suffering uh, from, from their oppression that um, I've, I will take care. There's another act of, of uh, my grace. I will take care of those injustices. 
But yet think of, uh, I'll show you one passage in uh, Revelation uh, 21. Uh, for those that may struggle with this as well. Uh, 21 and 4. Uh, for God's picturing new Jerusalem, that I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And imagine that heavenly uh, estate. And it says there, um, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no longer any death. There will be no longer any mourning, crying, pain. All these things have passed away. And how comforting that is. Except you really have to get the imagery. He will wipe away every tear. You know, why that imagery? Because you could just easily say that, well, you know, you won't have any, 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 any sorrow anymore, that type of thing. But imagine um, every tear, as if to say, each tear independently known for its cause in this life associated with the pain and the trials of this life are compensated for in the next. And a God that understands and knows all the suffering, all the pain, all the injustice, everything. And understands each tear, blots each, each tear like that. Not saying literally, but it's figurative speech for a God who absolutely knows everything, everything. And then it says, for the former things have passed away. You know, it uses the same verb that's used in 666 of John where Jesus said will you also go away remember this will you also go away and so everybody was leaving him this is the same imagery here of the former things are just going to be gone so um, even all these things that we spend so much time consumed about all the wrongs that have been done all the injustices Better left to the God who, the God who reconciled. See, this is the thing about the righteousness of God that we maybe fail to understand. All things work together for good means. You have a righteous God who is, who is basically one day going to bring rectitude, but ultimate justice of all things. That's what he's going to do. And you're either in line with his perfect rectitude and perfect righteousness or 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 you are not, and thank God through Christ we are, right? Um, which, is, which is awesome. One last thing is verses 11 through, through 16, where he talks about um, the, the oppressors and uh, in light of his future deliverance, and just to be grateful uh, with regard to uh, the one to whom we belong. And how many times he mentions in those verses, I'm your maker, I'm your God, you are my people. And he says, just look up into the night sky in verse 16, um, for example. And he says, I put my words in your mouth and have covered you with the shadow of my hand to establish the heavens, to found the earth. And it's it. So, basically saying there's evidence in the night sky. And I thought of James chapter one, uh, verses uh, 16 and 17, with this idea of God's good and perfect <coughs> gifts raining down upon us um, and are not like shifting shadows. In other words, they cannot be eclipsed. God's goodness, can, can, but sometimes it's through a veil of tears. It's through a, this oppression, through the difficulties of this world. We have to by intention, believe by faith, God, there's goodness there. I will, I will look for your goodness. You have to really look for it. You have to look for it by an intention and name it. And name it and name it and name it. I'll give you an example. So the Hebrew concept of gratitude is this hakarat hatov. It's this idea of um, to, to recognize the good. It's a great Hebrew concept. To recognize the good. And so you're just seeking out, affirming what is good in, in something. In the worst possible situation, still to say, but I'm here, but I'm alive, I'm still breathing, I'm still happy. You know, it's to recognize all the blessings and benefits of, of, all, that, of all that we have. So gratitude reconciles the lessons of the past with the plans for tomorrow in the goodness of God and 
lives for today. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for um, understanding us in our weakness. And thank you for um, uh, your, your patience. Thank you for um, uh, strengthening us. And thank you for giving us uh, cause to praise you and to you know, raise the altitude of our attitude every, every single day. And, uh, and Lord, help us to, to live by intention uh, in this, this place called uh, gratitude and to be just fundamentally thankful for we have just so much uh, to, to rejoice in what you uh, have given to us and continue to give us. Thank you that we have each other. Uh, and uh, help us just to continue a prayerfully vigilant, vigilant um, for one another as we go throughout this day and the week to come. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.